hope everyone is ready. I will go on with our presentation. As you know, today's presentation will be conducted by the Habitat team and Penang Green Council. But the first session is going to be handled by Penang Green Council, where we'll actually talk about bees. So if you're ready for the journey, here it comes. Dang, dang, dang. So today's presentation is called BZB Journey. So it will be conducted by Penang Green Council and it will be conducted by me. Hi, my name is Uze and I'll be assisted by my colleague, Ms. Ashawani. So we will guide you through on a world of bees. So hope you guys can learn more about them and hope you guys can start to appreciate them as they are. Okay, before I start with my presentation, so how, how many of you have actually seen a bee before? I believe every one of you would have at least encountered bees once in their lifetime, right? But are you sure that what you're seeing is actually bees? So here I will show you something that you might confuse you a bit. And here are actually the pictures of animals. You know, most of them think are bees, but you know what? Not all of them are. So I want everyone to have a look at this picture and tell me which of them are actually bees. Because not all of them are bees, so you can tell me which one of them are bees. So I hope you can you can try to identify. Maybe you know, maybe you don't. So try and see and try and tell me which one of them are actually bees. Because some of them are actually wasps and hornet. They look alike, but you know, they are a bit naughtier than, than your average bee. So so I can see that some of them uh yeah. Maybe some of you knew, some of you knew, some of you have encountered bees. Maybe some of you even have a bee farm. I don't know. But yeah, I think that most of you have the, the correct gist of an idea which one of them are bees. But then again, yeah, see, there's a lot of people who knew, knew something about bees. Some say number two, three, number five, six. Those are the, I say, the, the most answered questions and the most, uh, the most answered animals. But then again, Actually, some of you got it correctly, but for your, for your information, the only bees in these pictures are actually number five and six. And the number five is actually the honeybee that you know. You know, you eat honey every day, right? Not every day, but you've tasted honey, honey before. Those are actually produced by those number five and the gang. And number six is actually also bee, but this one is a larger kind of bee. It's called the uh, bumblebee. Yeah, and it's not the transformer one, but it is called Bumblebee. It is where the name came from. And I will actually tell you how to differentiate bees, wasps, and hornet. So I will go to the next slide. Here is actually the difference between bee, wasp, and hornet. So as you can see on the left side, it's actually a picture of a cute little bee having his sweet time, taking nectar. And then on the one on the right, it's just a wasp chilling and hanging on a rock, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so how to differentiate between bees and wasps? Bees are actually kind of furry and fuzzy. As you can see on this picture, wait, let me get my pointers on. Okay, here, you see they have a very hairy and fuzzy body. So yeah, that is the main way for you to distinguish between bees and wasps. You can see wasps, they are actually quite smooth. So quite different from bees. And aside from that, as you can see on the bee legs, there's this puny little dot it is actually a pollen basket. So a pollen basket is something that the bee would have, you know, when they go from flower to flower, they will collect pollen and recollect nectar. So a bee would oftentimes has a pollen basket. And when they visit from flower to flower, they, they will also spread the pollen of the flowers to other flowers. So which we will tell you what is the significance of it in the future. And of course, wasps and hornet, they don't really have a pollen basket because they don't really feed much on uh, flowers. So most of them are actually uh, consumed on other insects. And another big difference between the bees and the wasps is actually that the bee have much rounded abdomen. You can see there's a bit, there's a, they are a bit thick and they are a bit fluffier and wasps and hornet are usually thin and cylindrical. See, they are very slim. They, I don't know they work out or they're on diet, but yeah, they are very slim compared to bees. And last but not least, the difference between bees and wasps is that bees have actually flat legs. See, it's like almost like a crab leg, right? You know, it's kind of flat, it's kind of white. Unlike wasps and hornet, you know, they have very thin and long legs. 
So now you would have known the difference between the bees and the wasps. So yeah, but the main difference that you can see is actually bees have very furry and fuzzy body. So from afar, if you see a, a fuzzy and hairy flying creature around you, eh, you can safely say that is a bee. But if you see this on your side, I would suggest you to run away as quick as possible. All right. So now at least you know how to differentiate between the bee and wasp. I will also enlighten you on one of the other creatures that we have in this earth. It is what we call a stingless bee. No, because when we associate it bee with, uh, when we know bee, we feel like, oh, bee will sting you. But there's also a creature which we call stingless bee or melipenes. They are actually stingless bee. And they also produce honey like a honeybee. Although the honey might be slightly different and their nest is different, but they also produce honey. In Malaysia, we call them kelulut. I believe some of you might have known them or some of you might have tasted their honey before. So maybe you can tell us the difference between the taste of the honey from a kelulut and a normal honeybee. So oftentimes, kelulut's honey is actually a bit sourish. So it doesn't taste uh, as sweet as a honeybee's honey, but it is still as beneficial and as healthy for your health. So this is a picture of a kelulut. See, they still have a fuzzy body, but they don't really have a stinger, which makes them very human friendly. Even, yeah, they won't harm you. But they, they, their methods of protection is by, by biting, but they won't even bite humans. So they are kind, uh, they are very friendly creatures. So I hope maybe one day you can uh, have a visit to a Kalulut farm. You can see they are very, very small creatures, about the size of a fly. So this is how they look like up close. Quite adorable, right? Very, very round body, very fuzzy. So it is called Kalulut or stingless bees. Next, as you know, bees. If you ever been, uh, if you ever seen a bee nest, it's quite a big nest. Has a lot of bees, but bees actually have a different role and task. So there's like a job. For example, humans. You know, we have doctors, we have, uh, we have police, we have firefighters. Bees in their world, they often have three categories, and one of them is actually the 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 captain or the leader of the bee nest is actually the queen. So what does the queen does is actually the queen main purpose is actually to lay eggs. So she communicated with her son and then you know, every single day a queen would lay around 1,500 eggs. Imagine a human being that doing that. All our hospital will only be filled with babies. Imagine one human, you know, uh, reproduce from 1,500 eggs, uh, 1,500 of springs per day that would fill our hospital with just babies. So that is what actually the queen bee does. It lay around 1,500 eggs per day. It's quite a lot of eggs for one single bee. But that is what they do. And that is what their role is. And aside from that, we have the workers. The worker bees are actually, I can say, the backbone of the bee nest. Because they did almost everything in the nest. You know, they clean, they clean take care of the queen and the babies, you know, they repair the, the nest and also they also cool down the, the nest because the nest, you know, in Malaysia nowadays is getting hotter and hotter. So how does the bee keep the nest cool? It's usually the workers will move out their wings, act as a fan, you know, to cool down the nest. Imagine, you know, all of us, imagine you, a student in your classroom, you know how to make your class uh, cooler, you just fan out every single minute to make sure your class is cool. That is what they do. It's a very tedious job, I can ask you, I, I can tell you, but that is one of their roles, actually to keep the nest cool. And last but not least, okay, sorry, forgot to mention that the worker bees are actually the female bees. So all of the female bees in a honeybee's colony are actually workers. And now we're going for another one, it's actually the drone bees. This is, uh, this is actually the boy bee. And Unfortunately, they did almost nothing in the nest. So what they did is, you know, they just waited to be fed and then with a chance, a possible chance of mating with the queen. And that is it. So that is why during, you know, during the cold winter, which we don't have in Malaysia, but in other countries where there's winter, and when it gets cold, the drone bees are actually kicked out of their nest due to the fact that 
they are only you know they didn't they didn't do anything they only waited to be fed and maybe just to mate with the queen so they don't really contribute much to the nest so they have been kicked out during the winter so what will happen then basically this little fella would have died because you know it's cold so they cannot survive that is that that was done due to the fact that you know bees they want to um they want to save their resources so since the drone bees are not contributing to their society so they have to kick them out which is quite unfortunate but that is how they survive luckily in malaysia we don't have winter so the bees are you know do not the, the male bees would not have to go through such fate as the one that i told you just now and that is the tree classification of the bees and now i will go more in detail about this one in particular all right the queen so now i will talk to you about the queen from this big picture, can you tell me which one of them is the queen? I would it would be surprising if you didn't know which one is the queen. So yeah, can you can you tell me which one of them are the is the queen? I'm even pointing on it now. So it is quite different, right, from the others. As you can see, it's a huge difference between the queen and the worker bee. So yeah, the queen is actually the one in the middle. Here is actually the queen. Ta-da! So the size of a queen is very much different. Like from previous slide, you can see the queen is bigger from the, the worker bees. So this is the queen. You know, the queen itself are also chosen from random eggs. So it's not like they are descendant of royalties. All eggs are descendant of the queen. But usually the queen eggs, you know, just chosen at random. From a female eggs egg that has been fertilized so the difference between a the queen after the eggs have been laid they will actually pick the egg and then they will put it in a bigger cell you know because you know it's going to be the queen so it has to be uh, it has to receive a better treatment so they place in a larger cell and then they will fat royal jelly throughout their growth so like, what, actually what is royal jelly royal jelly is equivalent to milk in human world so the queen itself will be fat royal jelly throughout her entire life. Meanwhile, the other worker bees, they've only been fat royal jelly for a few periods of time and then they will be replaced with something else uh, and a different kind of food, which I will go into later. But the queen bee itself throughout their lifetime and throughout their growth will be fat royal jelly. And there is, you can see there can only be one queen actually in a honeybee's colony. So yeah, a queen bee will only be replaced if the queen bee is getting older or you know getting sick or somehow unfortunately being attacked. So only then it will be replaced. But until then, queen bee will remain the sole ruler of their colony. All right. So that is something that you should know about the queen. Basically, yeah, the leader of the colony. Now I get I will get to you on on uh, the life cycle of bees. So bees, as you know, they do not live like human. They do not have a lifespan of hundred years old. So their lifespan is actually just quite short. They the average life of a queen bee. This is a queen bee. So the average life of a queen bee is just three to four years. Unlike humans, we can live up to hundred years. I think the oldest human being is hundred something year old. So but the queen bee can only live for three to four years while the others you know just for around six to eight weeks this is the worker bee they can only live for six to eight weeks so at first how does the bee's life begin the queen lays an egg here as you can see the egg it is the size of a rice grain so yeah teeny mini egg so the queen will lay those eggs so the queen will lay eggs in all of these cells. You know, all the hexagonal shaped cells that you see on a honeycomb. Yeah, each and every one of those, actually the queen will lay egg. And then the egg is just like a very small and rice-like shape. So after three days, this egg will turn into larvae, which is like this. Still like rice, but bigger, kind of squishier. So for the first three days, all of the larvae will be fed royal jelly, as I mentioned earlier, like a milk substitute. While after only the queen bee will be fed royal jelly throughout their life. So for the others, just three days, they will be fed royal jelly, and then they will be fed with bee bread. 
even bees has bread but it's not like the bread that we have here like not like gardenia or massimo the bread that they have is actually a mixture of honey and pollen equivalent to their own kind of bread yeah not like our own whole meal bread or our gardenia bread so the larvae will be fed with bee bread until they are big enough and uh, usually during the 10th day they will fed bee bread and then they will close actually the worker bee will actually close the cell and then it's the time for the larvae to surround themselves with a silk like uh, structure and then to become a pupa so a pupa is basically like a cocoon of the bee so during the pupating phase a pupa will not be fed so they they grow up from the stored fat that they they've been uh, fed with throughout their larval period so after a while of being pupa and then they change as you can see they will start to develop features of a bee so from this just round elongated squirmy stuff is starting to look like a bee usually often on the 15th day so you can see the thorax you can see the head you can see the legs so after that period of time you know they are they will they will uh, start to exhibit b shape on their body and then they will morph out during the 21st day so usually earlier when bees come out they are slightly grayish in color and here as you can see after they've been uh, after they, they from from the pupa they will actually change to adult and they will break free from the call uh, from the nest and then they will do their own duty as you know workers or drones so both of them have the same lifestyle all right so actually how do actually bees communicate so bees actually communicate via pheromones or in a way pheromones are actually chemicals and scent for humans you know we talk we communicate we make noises bees you know they do not say a word they do not know how to talk so they communicate with chemical and scent and also via dancing that is something that my colleagues will share to you soon on their ways of their communicating via dancing so one of the pheromones or the scent that they use are uh, used to you know to tell them to defend their colony so that's called defense pheromone so it calls other bee to protect the nest from being attacked and then grow pheromone which are used for the larvae and pupae you know for them to grow mating this one is being used specifically by the queen to tell the male bee that the queen is ready for mating and then a feeding this one is being used by the larvae you know, to tell the worker bees hey i'm hungry so come and feed me so that is the chemical scent and pheromone that they release to the worker bees to tell them that they are hungry and they need to be fed okay so now actually i will pass the next session to my colleague miss ashawani for her to tell you on how do the bee dance and to show them how the bees actually can be their dancing so miss asha are you ready Okay, so we'll continue with this video. So like I told you before, we're going to see what is that special dance that is danced by the bee. All right. So you can see in E, you can collect a lot of um, honeys and they, in the wild, we if anywhere go. But now that they're going to coexist with us here, so they have to choose their places uh, particularly so that we humans don't disturb them. See? Bees that can see to actually collect honey. And you can see here, this is their house, I mean the hive. So on this one, returning bee, and this bee is going to tell us what the regular dance is. Okay, so this bee has just came back after the discovery of a new flowers. Okay. I think I already explained that the work. Now, can you see she's shaking her abdomen? 
as she is shaking her abdomen to get the attention of all her sisters because she has got a message to tell. Yeah. Now you see, everybody is like putting their attention to her. She's actually the one in the middle. Come on. That's moving with a vibration on her abdomen. And then there she goes. She's actually cueing them with a code. Say to show them that is her discovery. How magnificent is that? It's going to be sun and the flowers. So upon stage, some of them will be there. And some will immediately set off. We got the message from the sister. So they are going to find the discovery. And then they found it. Nine six kilometers away. And in one short season, to nine kilograms of honey. So that is the first thing about it. I got this uh, video from Smithson channel from YouTube so you can learn more um, about honey and their waggle dance from YouTube. When I pass back, so if you have any question regarding this waggle dance, you can always write to us. You can put it in the comment later. I'll try my best to give you the answer. Now I'll proceed on with the Honey making facts. Okay, so everyone have eaten egg honey before, right? So, but do you know that to produce one kilogram of honey would actually requires the bee to travel very far away? You no, know, they have to travel actually one hundred and ninety four kilometers for that. You can imagine how long is that? So I will tell you how long is that. It's equivalent to fourteen thousand plus kilo uh Penang Bridge Marathon, eh, Penang Bridge Penang distance. So imagine you have to go through the Penang Bridge for 14,000 times. That is just to produce one kilogram of honey. So imagine every time you take, you know, a teaspoon of honey, that is also equivalent to a four lifetime of bees life. Just to get one teaspoon of honey. And that is actually a lot of effort from their side. So you can imagine how much does it cost for the honey to actually, for the bee to actually just produce honey. And usually a single bee would have to actually visit hundreds of flowers every single trip. So they visit from one flower to another to another for a hundred flowers. Imagine you stop, stopping by to a hundred shop per day. That is actually quite a lot. Even if you go to Prince Bay Mall, they don't really have a, a hundred shop for you to visit. So imagine what a bee has to do to, to uh, uh, eat on each of its trip. And Another interesting fact about bees honey is that the flowers that they feed on actually affects the color of the honey. Sometimes it's darker, sometimes it's light. So the taste might be the same, but it depends on the flower that they feed on. So the color of the honey might change, but you won't be getting a blue colored honey. That would be weird, but we will get a darker honey color or a lighter honey color. So that is from the type of flowers that they feed on. And you know, when you consume honey, it is actually very thick, right? It's due to the fact that the bees fan it and to evaporate the water inside of the honey. So that is why the honey that you eat are thick and very viscous and you know, very concentrated. So because it is actually evaporated, all the waters of the honey is evaporated from there. And that is why honeys are thick and so delicious for you to consume. But yeah, for them, it requires a lot of time for them to create. Now, I will also tell you tell you about different things and unbelievable fact about honey. So as you can see from this picture in front of you, so as you can see, there's a different color of uh, animals, right? But actually, every single one of them are bees. Just that they are not all of them are honey bees, but they are all bees. So the one that you can see, this big black uh, furry fella in front here, is actually a carpenter bee. I know some of you might have uh, gone to your hometown or village where you know the houses are made of wood and most of the time you can actually see this animal burrow in them they are actually big i think around yeah around this size almost half of your finger 
so it's actually quite big and they actually are not dangerous they they do really sting people but they are very big and you would notice that next time when you go to a village area where the house are made of woods you can try and see whether you can see the nest of the carpenter bee or not and you know, um, female, uh, in bees world, only the female can actually sting you. So because the drone, as I can say, they basically do nothing. They just hang around in the in the nest. So those who have been stung by a bee means that you are actually been stung by the worker bee, which are the female bee. And then, of course, the sex of the bees, you know, the either the bee will be male or female, actually are determined by the queen itself. And as you can see from this picture, bees can actually carry pollen half their weight imagine if you are for example if you are 40 kilogram imagine you carry 20 kilogram with you every day to go around in circles from flower to flower that is actually quite tiring and that's what they can do how magnificent is the bee itself i don't even know how to describe and a colony of a bee you know when you see a nest of a honeybee the nest is actually the colony itself is actually can be immortal you know once the bee the queen bee is dead and it can be replaced so the nest can be there for many 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 years with replace of uh, the queen with the replacement of the queen bee and one more thing that you should know you should not mess around with bees because they actually have the capacity to recognize human faces so they might know whether you are naughty or nice so be careful when you're with them so they know oh, this guy is threatening this guy is not threatening so that's well, why you need to behave while you're around bees and also they uh, can be treated as biodetective so they can actually detect explosives and pollution so bees can actually know where landmines are you know where landmines you know the, the one where you step and it goes boom bees can actually detect that so they are actually considered as biodetective so they can actually sniff out bad environment area and then they can know where are the dangerous areas so that they don't tell the other bees about that uh, they can tell the other bees about that location okay so i will go to the next slide so this is one of the reasons because we've been hearing me talking about bees for a few minutes now and i would like to tell you on why we actually need to keep bees in this environment okay so bees they actually help to pollinate trees and then they produce fruits like apples melon and strawberries so if you go to supermarket, you can see like there's fruits, like apple, melon, strawberries. Those are actually help, uh, will help pollinated by bees. When bees go from flower to flower, it helps the flower to actually produce fruits. That is what they do. And also the honey that we ate is actually a good source of nutrients for human being. And a pure honey is actually, can actually last forever. It won't expire. That is if it's a pure honey. So imagine honey that can be passed through generations yeah, that is uh, good quality honey so it will never expire and then bees also like produce a wax uh, you know the, the the nest they have the hive you know the bees wax those things can actually be used as a packaging candle pain med, uh, house pain medication and cosmetics it also can actually be a substitute for plastic packaging which is very, very sustainable as you know plastic will last forever almost forever for hundreds of years while you know the beeswax packaging can actually be biodegraded after a few period of time which is also good for the environment and you know when bees pollinate trees they also help plant to grow when there's plant there's animals so the animals will have a shelter a place that they could call home so in a way bees are not just beneficial for human beings but they are also beneficial for other animals and other insects which makes them a friend of everyone so there's no reason for you to actually hate bees they are very friendly and they are very nice so now since you learn a lot about bees i will also go to the next part of our presentation which is the quiz so i hope everyone uh, a little of that, they will have a quiz session today.
seems we already know the winner. Wow, Evan is quicker than I expected. Everyone's like racing. Good, good. See, let everyone know. But later, yeah, I will have a look again and then announce you guys on who are the winner of all the quiz today. So thank you guys for participating on the quiz. Everyone is so quick. Great, great, great. And I hope the questions are aren't as, as deadly as you guys expected, right? It's very simple questions. So yeah, I will, for after this, we will actually continue on with our session with the habitat. But now I will have a say one last slide that I would like to share with you on our carry home message from the Penang Green Council. So actually, since everyone have learned about bees, I hope you guys learn a lot about bees. Usually, uh, I, I have cleared all the misconception if you have about bees and wasps. So I want you guys to be so kindness to the bees because they are actually adorable, the fella. They won't attack you if you don't disturb their nest. So what they, they are just doing their job from flower to flower, collecting nectars and then spreading the pollens everywhere to help plants to grow. So even the little creatures like them could actually make a huge difference to the mother earth. Okay, so I hope you can bear that in mind. And after this, we'll have a five minute commercial break somehow. And then we'll continue with the Habitat virtual tour. I hope you guys are ready because they are going to share with you on all of those creatures that you might not have even seen before. Those are creatures that lurk in the dark, which you know you cannot go out on the hill at night, but they will actually show you those amazing creatures. But wait for five minutes. I know everyone can go to the toilet, have a drink. And yeah, we'll continue back in five minutes. Sorry for any technical issues. Thank you again. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Better, better. Uh, uh, I will pass to Corina to start first. <laughs> uh, right. Thank you, thank different you. Screen. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Now on a different screen. Okay. So, all right. So, really, really sorry because we were sitting very far apart because of the echo. Now we are back. Okay. Everyone can hear me clearly. Right. Okay. Very good. Now, yes, finally. Okay. Yay. Yes. Oh, it's a yay from me as well. <laughs> all right, everyone. All right. Greeting from the hills. Okay, good day everyone. Before we start on a different adventure, I'd like to remind everyone once again about the rules. Make sure you're still muted. And then if you do have any questions you are very curious about um, this Habitat After Dark tour later, <laughs> later, feel free to ask us in the comment section. We have our technical teams who will answer <laughs> to all of you all the questions you have uh, uh, for us. Right, next, allow me to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Corina Puyang Jal. I'm one of the naturalists here at the Habitat Penang Hill. So earlier, we had learned a lot of cool facts about bees from Uzair and Asha. Thank you so much. Very insightful. Even myself, as one of the nature guide here, I learned something new today. Love it. And next, moving forward, we have a different adventure. We have something different. Okay, I know now it's very bright outside, <laughs> but we have a different tour. We call it Habitat After Dark. So now I want you all to just imagine it's all dark right now. You are in the middle of a rainforest at nighttime. The sun is setting and then it's cold, dark, it's misty. Well, that's how it normally is on the hill. Sounds scary, right? But don't worry. I promise you that this tour is going to be fun. It's going to be different. We are going on a night adventure inside the habitat Penang Hill. During the day, it's very easy to spot animals, right? You can see squirrels jumping around. You can see birds flying around. But what about nighttime? That's why we bring you this habitat after dark along with our two expert guides who will help us to spot for these nocturnal animals. Because when we walk in the dark, we're gonna help the expert and sharp eyes to spot these animals. So I'll introduce our very first guy. So we have Farah Dawood. Farah, come and say hi. Hello, <laughs> hi, I'm Farah. Uh, so we have Farah. She's also one of the naturalists here at the Habitat Penang Hill. And also our next guide, it will be Khadija. Khadija, she is actually junior environmental education executive from the Habitat Foundation. So, so, hi everyone, yes. my name is Khadija. I'm not sure if you can see Khadija, so we have Khadija here. <laughs> Everyone's trying to fit into one screen now. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, that's it from me. From here onwards, I'm going to pass it to Farah, and she will be guiding us walking inside the habitat at night time. So are you ready? Well, ready or not, we're going to start anyway. All right, Farah, 
It's All your right. time to take the lead. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Farah. So I'm one of the naturalists at the Habitat. So first of all, I would love to introduce everyone. Welcome to the Habitat and uh, welcome to the Curtis Press. It's actually the photo that you can see on, the, on your screen right now. So this is how we actually uh, start our night tour. Normally after the sunset viewing, we start to gather everyone at the base of the Curtis Crest. Then uh, that's the time that the sky will be getting darker and then we will pass the lantern to some of the guests uh, before we go back into the trail. All right. So right now, what we're waiting for, light up your headlamp, everyone. Yeah. And let's start the adventure. Okay. All right. So, okay, we can go to the next one. Okay. We want to listen the sound. Yeah. So this actually the sound that normally we'll hear if you go to the forest at night time have anyone have everyone here been to the forest at night time before i would love to see some of your comment please become very active in the comment section yeah we want to see oh oh never oh oh a lot of you guys have been to the forest before that's great so this is sound have, can you hear the sound because i couldn't really hear it right now we're just going to play a yeah. sound, so we're going to repeat it. Again. All right, right, yeah. Let's see if we can hear it. Yes. Yeah. So this is sound you normally can hear if you go to the forest, and uh, this is sound of the cricket. They start singing, and they're actually taking over the job of the cicadas. So cicadas is the sound that you hear during the daytime. Yeah, but nighttime is a sound. Yeah, this is a song that you will hear along the way. So along this journey. We are actually uh, going to play a guessing games, yeah, which is we try to spot the animals around and we use our sense of hearing and sight to spot them uh, along the trail. All right. Okay. So, and don't forget to drop your answer in the comment section and we'll look through that afterward. All right. So let's start with the first one. Okay, let's see. Let's start. Yeah, let's go for the next slide. All right. All right. So try to guess what's the creature that makes this sound right now. All right. Yeah. So this is a sound that you actually, when you go to the forest into the trail, you normally can hear them making the sound at the slope area. All right, mm. and yes, the quiet. <laughs> the quiet. Um, okay. I said cricket. Cricket. Uh, Umay also said cricket. Uh, a lot oh. of pe people saying crickets actually not bad. Keep guessing. Keep guessing. Keep the answers coming. Yeah. We would love to hear two key interesting answers as well. A very noisy cricket. Yes, a very noisy cricket indeed. Yeah, <laughs> <that's true. laughs> All right, so I think it's for us to reveal the answer right now. A lot of, oh, cicada. Oh, there's a cicada will make the sound during the daytime. Yeah, so let's reveal it. Katidi, bush cricket. Yes, they do make sound during the nighttime as well. All right, so it's our forest cricket. All right, so we normally know that how cricket make the sound, like just now you hear from the previous slide, they make the typical kind of cricket sound. It's like creak, creak, creak. Yeah, mm -hmm. but now you know that we have another kind of cricket and they can make another kind of sound as well. And this sound is actually not the loudest yet that you can hear. If you come and experience by your own with our night tour, then you can actually hear. They can make a louder call than this. And there's also some people say that if you hear it for too long, mm -hmm. it can even damage your eardrum. Yeah, so watch out when you go around the forest. Yeah, make sure you try to look for them and don't listen for too long. Yeah, yeah. you normally can see them make a burrow at the slope area and that's how we can find them. Yeah, they're quite a big cricket actually. All right, so let, I think we can move to the next one. Justin Chen actually said Kathy did. That's a very good guess actually, um, Justin, because Kathy did also make calls. Mm -hmm. And we sometimes get confused thinking, that, oh, is this a cricket or is this a Kathy? There are some Kathy quite big size. 
and it make yes. quite a loud sound as well. Yeah. And um, oh, Wong Jin Lee asks, will bigger crickets make louder sounds? Well, the one that we see is quite big size and they are very loud. And there's a difference between cicadas and crickets also, right, Farah? Yes, that's right. So uh, I would say the main difference that we can find is uh, the time when they produce a call, uh, which is cicadas go for the day, cricket at the night time. And uh, there's some people say, ask, ask why they make the sound. Uh, this sound is actually the mating call. Mm. Yeah, and language the answer there, yeah, to attract the female one, yeah. So it goes the same for cicadas as, uh, as well. When they make the sound during the day, they also purposely make the call to attract the female as well. So it's a mating call for them. I would say it's a love song that you hear when you go to the forest. Yes. It's either day or nighttime. All right, so uh, we can go to the next one. This is the image of the forest cricket. They're, uh, they're actually inside the burrow. So they normally would come out like at the entrance of the burrow to produce the call and um this is uh, this a uh, kind of uh, image that you will normally can find when you go for the night walk mm -hmm. yeah all right so i think it's okay uh, since we cannot play the video we can just move to the next one and continue our guessing game again yes yeah uh, okay. so let's hear for this one so we can play the sound and let's guess what is the one that I'm making this call right now So the sound that we want you to get is the tick tick tick. Still for four. Four? Yes. So that's a very good guess. It's actually very soothing, but get quite long to be if you bring it uh, um, in the trail itself. And there's a piece of this photo. Yeah. And you can try to get to get a small picture, a big mammal, or to get a bird, something like that. That's good. Like frogs, so, 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 so the sound was clicking, clicking, clicking. Yeah. Okay. So let's preview the answer and let's see what kind of uh, frog or anything that produces it. All right. So it's our dwarf bush frogs. Okay. So a lot of people did answer it correctly. It is actually a frog. And the one little friend here, the dwarf bush frog, is actually very small, just about uh, three to five centimeter big. But still they can make a very loud call Go yeah <laughs> yeah so uh this sound is actually how they communicate with each other yeah mm. okay so uh i think we are good to go to the next one all right mm. so it's another guessing uh, sound guessing game okay let's play the sound oh all right so this sound very familiar for a lot of people, I guess. And if you watch a uh, horror movie uh, or people like, come to the scene in the nighttime, the forest, you normally can hear this kind of sound effect. Yeah. Any of you heard, heard about this sound before? Anyone yeah. want to try to make a guess? I think it's quite easy for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if you can guess it right. Yeah. Well, there's no thing I would say on this photo. Yeah, yeah. you can you can expect the leaves when I make a sound, right? The yeah. photo on yeah. 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 Doesn't, have, doesn't have a cool family. So we would like to see what do you think it is? Is it an insect? Is it a mammal? Or is it a ghost? <laughs> a leaf can definitely make you produce a call if they bite you, isn't it? Yeah, especially for those who don't like to eat. Yeah, so those people who are being bitten, yeah, they're the one that's going to make the sound. Yeah, but that's, a, that's not the answer. Yeah, I want you guys, you guys to guess the sound that you hear right now. Any answer? Yeah, we so can see people commenting here. So that's the call, the ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
that's the one. That's the one that we want to uh, try to get. I wonder if it's a big animal. That sounds like a quite a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you might thought that it actually comes from a mammal because it has a lot of mammal for you know species as well. Yeah. So maybe a mammal too. Yeah. It could be a bird or any other thing as well. Would you like to do that first? Because I think a lot of people. Yeah. All right. Not so sure. Okay, sure. No worries. <laughs> Let's review right now. Let's see what's the one that's making the sound. Jang, jang, jang. All right. So it's mm. our brown hawk owl. Yeah. Mm. So uh, this one here, you might have heard about this name before. Yeah, or some people also call them, they have another common name, which is the brown boobook. So they're actually actively praying for their food at night time and just stand still on the tree during the day, sleeping, of course. Yeah. And other than this, our, this one is actually one of the common ones. If you come to the habitat for our, our night tour, I would say most of the time, uh, the owl that we can spot is this species of owl, which is our brown boo boo. But mm. other than this, are there any other owl that we have around? Yes, we do have. Yeah, uh, I will give you some uh, some of the species that we do have around here, which is the oriental scoop owl, uh, spotted wood owl, and buffy fish owl. Those are the ones that we commonly can see up in a hill. All right, and they uh, normally can be found perching on the dead tree at night time and you can easily spot them from their eye shine especially when you go to the forest uh we bring along a red lamp that's how you can spot them by uh use a red lamp and then when it shine on the on their eye then you can easily spot with your eye shine all right so but if you can spot them you just have to walk and listen carefully because you still can hear them from afar okay mm -hmm. all right so uh let's go to the next one is there anything that we can hear or see? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So now we just, uh, we already use our sense of hearing to identify some of the animal that we have along the trail. And now we're going to use our sight uh, because actually uh, we do have a lot of animal that might gonna cross the trail as well. So you have to watch on your step. And as you can see on this photo here, this is actually one of the species that we have around is our green eye gecko or we call them as a gecko smithy eye. Their size is quite big. I would say almost 15 centimeter. They can make a very loud call. We have mm -hmm. one in our admin office here. Yeah, so it's very a good shot as well that you can see here this gecko here they just it just caught a dragonfly so you can see the dragonfly is still in its mouth yeah so that's one of its diet okay so now let's continue our adventure let's see what's coming next mm. okay so where is this place uh so i'm just going to share with you this is actually part of our Langur way or our canopy walk inside the habitat so can you see what is there it look like a green rope like yeah, uh, yeah sticking on the fence oh. yeah do you have any idea what I is can it see some people giving good answer very very interesting answer like danger noodle <laughs> oh. no, don't like snakes ah oops oops oops, oops. Oops, oops, accidental uh, reveal. Pretend Sorry. I didn't see anything. <laughs> Pretend I didn't Sorry. see anything. <laughs> Edmund Cox said small and long. Jin Lee said so cute. Oh, very subjective, yeah. Okay. Some people find this very cute for us. Is it cute for you, Far? Uh, yeah, I would say it's cute, but I never really did handle this before. I would say I would love to handle a like, cute thing on my yeah hand, but, but I never really did. Yeah. Yeah. When Far said handle, she means holding it. Not yeah. just like using a snake hook, no. Yeah. She, Farah here, she likes to touch and hold snakes. <laughs> it's something that uh, you guys can also experience if you come to the habitat because what we do here is that when we found a non-venomous snake along the trail, we normally we try to uh, handle them with our hand and then we will ask our guests to uh, hold them as well. So that those people who are so afraid uh, of this kind of animal creature, they will slowly uh, will become, uh, I would say, brave. Mm -hmm. Or oh, yeah. Okay. So what we have there with this oh. bite? So with this bite, and then some people said 
Wangler Pit Viper. Wangler Pit Viper. Okay, <laughs> so I think, it? yeah, we can review right now since yeah. yes, you can see already just now. It's okay. We can just review. I will share with you a lot more. It's okay. So, yeah, it's actually our Wangler Pit Viper. So, someone asks either they can bite or not. Uh, this fella here actually they are very chill. If you see them around, they are just gonna like stick on the tree, resting mm -hmm. on the branch. They won't move at all unless you do something to disturb them. Then they're just gonna move away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so far we, I think when they feel triggered, then that's the time that we try to strike you. But mm -hmm. other than that, if you just use something like to just move them away, they will slowly will move from that area yeah and they do have venom they are one of the venomous species we have around okay and just something that i want you guys to uh make a guess again because in this uh, on your screen that you can see right now there's two wangler speed viper mm. and wangler speed viper actually they look different for male and female so can you make a guess which one is the male which one is the female one mm. anyone try to guess for this uh, normally in bird world uh, the male is prettier than the female and in spider world, the female is bigger than the male. So what about snake world? Mm, so we do have some people giving answer here. Ling mm -hmm. says, left is male. Left the is first male. is female. Okay. Julie said, male is the bright green color one. Mm, good, good, good answer. Keep them coming. Left is male. Okay. And by the way, uh, Ahmad Zafir here, Dr. Ahmad, share with us, when you see snakes, observe them from a safe distance. Yes. That's a very important advice. Unless you are experienced in handling snakes, if you're not familiar with snakes, you don't know what snake it is, the best is to leave it alone. Unless you know, oh, you know for sure that this is a non-venomous species and it doesn't bite as well, mm -hmm. then you handle it. Because Farah, we know from experience, right? Yeah. Although the snake is non-venomous, doesn't mean it doesn't bite. <laughs> yes, they do bite. Yeah, so get experienced a few times, get bitten by them yeah oh, okay a lot of answers coming in for us they say right is male left female males are bigger, bigger. okay mm. so well i'm going to review the answer but don't get mad with me because <laughs> the answer is both of these photos are female wanglers peat viper oh they're both yeah. female they're both females <laughs> oh. <laughs> what? okay so why in this uh photo you can see they look different because for Wangler Street Viper when they are juvenile they actually uh, when they're being born they do have similar pattern uh, almost similar pattern and color for male and female one but somehow for female Wangler Street Viper when they are grow bigger they will start to change the color and when they're fully grown they're gonna have black and yellow color and yes uh, well actually just now someone said male bigger but not for this species here for them, the female is bigger than the male one. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So that's well done, Farah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I guess that's about it. Yeah. Let's move to the next one. Let's see. All right. Oh. oh. Okay. So okay. what we have here? So it looks like we have a burrow with something hairy inside. Mm. Yeah. Spooder. Spooder. <laughs> that's a nice one, Ling. <laughs> Tarantula. Ooh, tarantula. 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 Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. So, Lord said tarantula. Mm -hmm. We do have tarantula in Malaysia. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I don't like spider. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Some people have spider phobia, but well, Farah will show you more about this spider later. Like, not they're, they're, they're actually most of the time they mind their own business. Yes. This is us accidentally go and oops, disturb them. Yes, <laughs> true. All right. So, well, actually, uh, it is normal for people to afraid or I, I think that it's not really a right uh, sentence. I would say be careful with the spider because mm -hmm. most of spider they do have uh, their venom, but somehow we just have to know which species is either their venom is strong or not. Yeah, that's all. Mm -hmm. And okay. So we can review the answer now because a lot of people already answer the yeah, right one. So it is a tarantula. We call it as a black female tarantula. So for this certain species we have here, uh, actually there's some research done on it. And this species actually, it might, uh, can only be found on Penang Island. Yeah, so that's make the night tour in the habitat very interesting if we can find one yeah for that night okay and uh someone said um 
can see anyone ask about the venom most certainly like venom have very mild effect. effect yes true yes. okay and someone say about trapdoor spider while well, trapdoor spider their, their nest won't look like this yeah so uh for trapdoor spider as you can see their name itself they do, they're gonna have a door mm -hmm. and it's well camouflaged it's very hard to see them uh it's one of the species we have here as well okay so this tarantula is one of the common residents Oh, where's the eye? Okay, okay, never mind. Uh, this, this tarantula is a common resident at the slope area. So I would say it's quite easy for the naturalist, for the nature guide to find one for you for uh, each of the night two that you have in this, uh, in, the, in, in the park. But it depends on the weather because sometimes when it rains, because this spider, they're very sensitive to vibrations. So whenever there's something like pass in front of their nest, if it, if the, uh, I would say the vibration is too strong, they won't come out because they feel that that thing might be strong. So they're only going to come out if the thing that causes a vibration is very light. So they know, okay, it's maybe something that they can eat, mm -hmm. uh, like, like the insects. cricket. Yeah, like the insect, like the cricket. So that's the time that you're going to see them coming out and grab the food. Okay? Yeah. So but I want to say social distancing for us. Very good. Yeah. A spider may be a good way to social distancing when you go in a crowd. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, just in, uh, ask, can they shoot their hair in defense? Uh, their hairs, okay. So, well, it's not really like shooting. Yeah, and actually the hairs on their legs is fine. Yeah, they won't cause itchiness. And the one that they will, I would say they use their legs to scratch the hairs on the abdomen. Yeah, and then you're going to flick out. And then that's, it's very tiny and very light. So that's the one. Uh, that can cause itchiness and it's very dangerous if you get intact your eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we do that to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the one that you have to be careful. But most of the time, if you're scared of them, they're actually even uh, more scared of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, what's coming? Where's the eye? You can actually see the eyes actually is very tiny. And mm -hmm. if you notice in this photo here, we know that the fact spider have uh, four pairs of legs, but you can see it's total of look like 10 legs here right mm. so what's the extra two the extra two legs is actually nearby the fang there it's called as the paddy pops and they use it to search and digging mm. yeah mm. so that's why they look kind of like have 10 legs, legs. <laughs> but no yeah okay so let's go for the next one Okay, this oh. one is quite easy too. Anyone want to guess? Uh, already Justin is giving a good guess. I think she, he already yeah, gave a good guess even before the accidental reveal. Yeah. <laughs> so Rowan said gecko. And Ling, Ling was like, oops. <laughs> Jin Lee, lizard. Yeah, the eyes. Someone managed to see the eyes earlier. <laughs> chicha. That's correction, I. That's definitely chicha. Yeah. <laughs> Look at the legs. It's very, yeah, it's very for us to guess it's a chicha here. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's the lizard because the pet, uh, I mean, the body look exactly like the common chicha mm -hmm. lizard that we have. It look like our home lizard as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we can review the answer. So we can share more about this species we have here. All right, so it's Alpine banded gecko. It's very good shot that we have here. You can see the eyes, a very big eyes. And it's, it's, uh, it's actually named literally because of the pattern on their back, uh, which is a banded pattern. And why it have the pinning word on their name? Because this species here is actually one of the endemic species to Penang Island. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you can find one in the in the trail, you are very lucky because you can find it as well uh, in the world. Yeah. Only here on <laughs> Penang Island. Yeah. What? Eyes brighter than my future. Oh, 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 oh I can relate. <laughs> yeah, some of us can relate. <laughs> Duta chicha. Duta chicha. That's okay. very nice. Okay, so where you guys can find this Penang Bandit Gecko, uh normally for our night tour, we mm. love to spot them. Uh, there's sometimes we cross the trail. That's why you have to watch on your step. Mm. And the best spot, I would say, is actually at the cover of the drainage because that's one of the habitat. They will stay inside the drainage on the daytime and nighttime, they will start to popping up their head from the cover. That's mm. how we can find them. And you can uh, notice the juvenile normally going to have a vibrant yellow color. Mm. And uh, once they grow bigger, they're going to have a dull color but the banded pattern on it is going to stay. 
Yeah. Okay. So we can move to the next one. Let's continue. Ah. Oh, what a good shot. Something yeah, glowing. Good shot. Yeah, blow in the dark. <laughs> Have you seen this glowing thing before in the forest? Uh -huh. Oh, scorpion, yeah, scorpion. scorpion. Links with scorpion, just it's very easy, scorpion. right? Yeah, it's very easy to yeah. see. Like you can see that stinger at the back and then the pins at the front, you know already. Yellow, <laughs> yellow, yellow scorpion. scorpion. Mm. Mm. Justin, are you sure it's yellow? <laughs> oh, okay. I forgot the name. Okay. 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 <laughs> keep keep the answers coming. Okay, everyone knows it's a scorpion. Yeah. But no, no one know what scorpion it is. Yes, because what species uh, uh, scorpion we have? Okay. Tiny so, venomous. Tiny mm. venomous. Far, far away, right? There's no. Yeah. Like it's tiny venomous or not. Okay. All right. So we can uh, reveal it. What's the answer? Okay. Mm. So it's our box scorpion. Okay. So you can see it look like very big, right? But no, they are actually very tiny. I would say maybe about four to six uh, centimeters. For um, a female one, and the male one gonna have a size roughly about six to eight centimeters. So they're very small actually, mm -hmm. and uh, you can see. Can you notice something like peculiar on this photo? Yeah, look like the body looks so odd. Like mm, it was that. <laughs> Maybe some people can't oh. actually watch this for too long as well. <laughs> yes. So oh, someone said ew. <laughs> oh wow, I'm shook. Those names. Million stingers, mm. the children. <laughs> Pincers are smaller, they generally have more potent toxin on the scope. Oh, it's baby. Are those the babies? So, oh, all right, yeah. tell them. <laughs> yes, that's true, actually. Those are the babies of the scorpion. It's a very great model we have here. Yeah. <laughs> so, normally, this uh, for, for scorpion, they will keep the juvenile on the back for quite some time. This actually to prevent uh, those babies from the predators that might be around. Yeah, so that they can have a longer lifespan until they are not always fully grown. When they are, can uh, adapt with the environment, they can be independent. Then they start to move by their uh, by themselves. Yeah, okay. And the photo you see earlier that they are like glowing. Do you know why the body glow? Someone yeah. gave a good answer earlier, but mm -hmm. tell them. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. So it's actually because of the exoskeleton uh, of their body actually covered by a layer called as a cuticle. And that cuticle have uh, another thin layer we call as a hyaline layer. Yeah, so the hyaline layer is the one that will react with the UV light, and then it will cause it the uh, cause the body to glow. And there's actually a lot of research that been done. Um, they're thinking why they have to make it glow, why they want to show themselves in the dark. Do, do they want to expose themselves to the predator? Well, there's no there's no really an exact answer for that, but there's some theory coming out saying that they just want to spot each other, one another. There's some theory saying that uh, it's actually part of the heat sensor. So they will know where is the shady part that they, they can go for hiding. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's the purpose, okay? All right, so I think, yeah, we're good to go with the next one. Right, yeah, so okay. Okay. Uh, Oh, okay, okay, no, yes, you can speed. <laughs> okay. All right, okay, okay. I will pass to Karina. All right, so I'm taking it back for a moment, very, very short while. So, here on the screen, you can say, I can see that they say there are vampires on Penang Hill. So, I wonder if there are vampires. For myself, I haven't seen like the vampires like in Twilight <laughs> or Malaysian vampire, the Pontiana. <laughs> I'm not sure whether we do have that kind of vampire. But now we're going to move on to our next uh, half of animals. And Khadija here can tell us whether we do have vampires on Penang Hill or not. Because she is the expert for vampires. <laughs> <Sorry now. laughs> so I can hear the, the creepy background over here. <laughs> Some creepy for me too. Yes. There is a vampire on a Oh, yep, it's real. Yeah, it's real. Um, like, uh, Karina said just now, it's kind of like a uh, vampire, and in Malay, and people usually call it a Pontiana. Yeah, so, um, anyone can guess? Oh, oh. some people are giving very good answers. Oh. Nope, they are I'm here. Oh, oh, bats, Batman. Batman. That's a false vampire bat. Okay. Good answer. Oh, okay. Vampire bats. Oh, a lot of people giving bats. Um, yeah. Khadija. So, okay. should we reveal yeah, yeah. what vampire we have? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. What is it? 
Is it really bad? Is it pointy? Is it something else? <laughs> Such a tiny vampire. Oh, someone oh. even gave us the scientific name. Oh, wow. Ah. Oh, wow. I knew this. <laughs> well done. All right. Show us the, the, the image. Who's there? The image of the this vampire here. Oh, we are a CLHS student. High School student. Oh, you've been uh, to the park before, I, I, I believe. Think, yeah, <laughs> they've been here. Okay. Okay. Give me <laughs> Uh, Chung Ling's the best. Okay. Ooh. What? She I said, what? Vampire crab? Yeah. Cute neighbors. Yeah, cute neighbors. It's not that scary one. It's just a cute little tiny vampire. Mm. So um, it's called as a Penang Hill vampire crab. Also has a name Penang Hill in front. Yes. Yeah. Like for us see that they are like Penang Gecko is also the endemic one. And this crab also one of the endemic species on the Penang Hill. Mm. Yeah, so it's actually newly found and described in 2016. Mm -hmm. So the Josama Faustum, the Faustum is the, is meaning as uh, lucky. So after a few years back and then now in 2016, they just have found it. Mm -hmm. It's quite amazing. Very amazing. Yeah. Like, actually, that, that's the thing about Penang, I believe. Yeah. Actually, we have, a, despite this island being small, there, there seems to be a lot of endemic species yes, exactly. on the hill, yes, and this so one especially. That's one of the beautiful of Penang. Uh, I, I should yeah. have said another duta here in Penang. Oh. Admin said blood is their craving. Oh, yes. Uh, actually, ironically, they actually eat. They are actually eat a mosquito larvae. Yeah. The, real, the, real uh, the real vampire here is a mosquito, actually. Yeah. Not, <laughs> not crab. <laughs> so, actually, um, if you can look over here, it's quite big. Like it looks like a big one, but then it's just small one. It just the size can be as big as your palm. It's just small mm -hmm. one. The I biggest is one like this one. Just really tiny one. I want one, said Robin. Mm. Um, uh, I'm Will sorry. <laughs> I cannot give you. <laughs> it's so precious over here. <laughs> okay. Oh, is it? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. It's a moss. <laughs> this one's a like grass. Yeah. So this one, like all the animals that we shown you today, is all the nocturnal animal. Nocturnal mean that they are really active at night time. So let's move to another slide. It means mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Ah, okay. Okay. So so supposedly we have a video. So this fella, oh wow, who that's cute. Uh, yeah, it's really cute. The eyes is quite big. Gliding mama. A oh, mama. Oh, mammal. Mammal. <laughs> <laughs> mama. Where? Yeah, I like to mama. Oh, yeah. So Jenny is like cute. Yeah. So, cute. so we can see it's a Sunda Kolugo. Yeah, it's a Sunda Kolugo. But or... I believe not many people are familiar with Sunda Kolugo, Khadija. Yes, so exactly. share with them. So um, this, like, like I saw just now, what? who uh justin said that it's a gliding mammal yes it is a gliding mammal and then with a if a good hiding skill we call it as a camouflaging mm. uh, if you can see over there your skin it looked like a tree bug you know mm. so that's kind of camouflage make the predator is soft confused yes but even i confused when i go into a forest and <laughs> want to find them true true yeah. true Speaking from experience also, <laughs> if it wasn't because of the eyes, yeah. because when you do a night walk, you will use a very bright headlamp. Yeah, exactly. So if it wasn't because of the eye shine, normally from the colugo, it's very hard to spot them. Really hard. Yes. And then other than that, actually, they can be found in a forest, either in a primary or a secondary. And sometimes you can find them at the beach or a plantation mm -hmm. because they do eat fruits as their diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Like this one, uh, I've read in Facebook last few years, they kind of like saying they, the villagers found this Sunda Klugo and they say that it's a really weird 
an mammal because mm. like no one seen them so they yeah, see that oh it's a weird dog mammal so like oh it's a something something coming out something like too creepy you know mm -hmm. and then but actually because of uh people less study about them so everyone oh. didn't know about them yeah yes, yes, it's quite true. sad yeah very little study is done on sunda kolugo yeah. if you want to learn more about this you can follow the night spotting project uh, we have uh, one student doing studies on Sunda Kolugo, yeah. and you can learn more from the Facebook page, uh, Night Spotting Project. Yeah, exactly. So, Uze, let's move to the next slide. So, anyone? Oh, uh. Yeah, because we already read it, uh, revealed the answer, so, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, this fella called as a red giant flying squirrel. Oh, and then oh. it's cute. Yeah, it's really cute. The eyes is really big, and then it's hard to spot them too. Yep. And then this one, as we all know, that is actually not a flying one. It's just mm. a gliding, a gliding from tree to tree for their movement. And mm. then they are really a boreal. A boreal means that they are live on the tree. Mm, yes. Yeah, they they won't come down. Oh well, ruin. Give the scientific name. <laughs> Carista, yes, oh. very easy to memorize, yeah. right? This is the easiest scientific name exactly. to remember. So no mammal can fly except bat. Yes, yes, exactly. Correct. That's true. So the actual term for this squirrel should be gliding, gliding squirrel. Yes. So this picture was taken by my friend Alice during the night walk inside the habitat. So we spotted the eyes, and then we started to kind of like excited because that one the first sight of uh in our team so it's like oh it's something yes, yes even yes, yes, i yes. uh i this is the first time i saw inside the habitat it was like mm. so exciting to see them so if you really want to see a flying squirrel with your own eyes not just on a picture yeah pay us a visit <laughs> <laughs> you, you you come and visit us yes i almost forgot a bit wasn't a mammal uh, lucky, uh, <laughs> lucky cage, yes, it yeah. is, it is, it is. So let's move to the next slide. <laughs> Look like platypus. <laughs> oh, platypus? Is it? <laughs> uh, a bit. <laughs> Not really. What do they eat? They do eat like uh, leaf, shoot, fruits, and sometimes seed, lichens, tree bark. Mm -hmm. They are more to herbivore. So, <laughs> let's move on to the next yeah. one. Okay, let's move on. Oh, okay, all right. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, okay. Just hold it first. Okay. Ah, yes. So, so you you can try to guess what this animal is. Oh, someone is already guessing. Yeah, <laughs> you, is, you can see. Is. You can look. Just look at this image here. Yeah. So what this animal is doing here is actually scratching its neck on this uh, rattan here. Yeah. So in this fact, is one of the image. Uh, yeah. Yes, this is one of our footage from our camera trap yeah. uh, in the park. We do set up cameras on certain trees yeah. where we normally spot this animal, mm -hmm. and we will retrieve it up after about one to two months mm -hmm. yes, to, uh, to go through it to yeah. see what animals we can find. And we were. We're very, very lucky because yeah. for myself, I've seen this twice in the park oh, okay. during the night walk. Okay. But many people, even though they've been the, in the park for mm -hmm. four years, never, never seen this one. Exactly. Yeah, never. so we're lucky to capture this one on the camera trap. And I can see like, oh, how satisfying scratching. I know, right? <laughs> Seeing animals yeah. excite me. Yes. Oh. oh, someone said it's venomous. One of the very few mammals to have it. Ooh, very, very, very good. That's really very, very good. good answer, answer. so let's reveal it who's there like, okay. some people already got the right answer. right answer yeah exactly so here you go it's a slow loris but then you know what despite of its name slow it's not slow yeah. <laughs> i've been spotted uh one time with um priscilla which is uh she is the founder of the, the, night, the night, night spotting project. project yes exactly so uh we spotted once and then at the plantation and then mm. at that time, this Lolo is eating a durian. Yes, eating a durian. Yes. I heard this story. I was wondering, how did it open the durian? <laughs> <laughs> Just make a hole, you know? Yeah. Just looking out and then put its head inside the durian and keep eating. 
Mm. Yeah. A lot of people say, um, oh, interesting. That is a cute one. Mm. So it is cute, yes, but tell cute. us what's dangerous about this one. Okay. Like, uh, just now I saw someone saying about is it is a kind of like a venomous mammal, right? So it is a venomous mammal and then it's actually a pr produce a oil. Oil? Yeah, oil inside like, its body. Like our like face. Our <laughs> oil. <laughs> uh, the oil they produce um, at the elbow. And then when it gets trained, uh, the oil will mix up with the saliva. And then this lurus will leak uh, to the whole body. Oh, yeah, spread it all spread around. All over around. Mm. And then when people cut it, the oil will go into your hand. And then it's actually when it cut, like, uh, it will, if you're shocked, it will cost that actually. It's oh. cost that to human. Okay, so it's cute, but it's deadly. It's deadly. <laughs> yeah. So, so when sad. you see a slow lorry, just see it from a distance, enjoy the cuteness. No, just enjoy the cuteness. And never touch them. Yeah, yeah. Justin said here, many primates are poached extensively. Yes, driving them to the brink of extinction. I'm not sure if all of you know. Um, in Penang Botanical Garden, you can always see the long-tail macaque, right? Yep. And recently, they are classified as vulnerable. Yes, exactly. A long-tail macaque, uh, something that you can see every day, is now vulnerable. So if you do see any wildlife pet uh, trading, if you see someone keeping these kind of animals as a pet at home, please do report them. Yeah. Uh, you can secretly take pictures and report to Pahilitan because yes. that's not where this animal should be. Yes, this animal exactly. should be in the in wild. wild. Mm. Oh, yes. I saw one people, um, yeah, are they slow in motion? They are slow in motion when you spot it, but then if you kind of like sudden talk to your friends, like hi, and then you will lose it forever. You will miss it forever. Oh, it's you quite mean, fast. Oh, you mean yeah. actually? It move fast. It can move fast. fast. Uh, also. Yeah, also yeah. like this is from my own um, experience doing the night walk. Um, when we spotted the slow lorries, it was very relaxed. So it was moving rather slow. Mm -hmm. So it really suits the name for me, but for from what for, Kadija shared. Yeah, for me, it's <laughs> not really. And then I was like so frustrating because we miss it forever. Ah, <laughs> so if you want to see these animals, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Come and visit us. But the thing about this animal, yeah. they are home. Mm, yes. Yep. Yes. So let's see. Let's see. Is there any. If we still have else? anything else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Jose, let's move to the next. Oh, ah, I'm, I'm okay. so sorry. That one is the last oh, animal for today. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, uh, for those of you who wants to watch the videos of all these nocturnal animals, please do visit our Facebook yep. page because r during the uh, MCO time, we actually share a lot of this footage on our Facebook, and you can try check out our uh, Instagram also, the Habitat Penang Hill. You might be able to find them on our Instagram as well. Uh, if you do have any question, feel free to ask us. We mm -hmm. are open. To accept any question, yeah. like if you don't have any question, if you suddenly remember something a bit later, you can always message us on our Facebook, on our Instagram, DM us. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I think that's it from that's us, the yeah. Habitat team, actually. So, I hope despite all the technical problem, the hiccups here and there, <laughs> uh, I hope you learn something new because for us, that's what matters. You learn something new, you are exposed to something new uh, about what we have in the park. So these are the nocturnal animals. So during day, we have different animals. So if you want to see them, pay us a visit. It's either day or nighttime. Uh, recently, we just uh, opened again our sunset walk. So you can come for the sunset walk and proceed with our night tour. Ah. Okay. So Uze, I think I'm going to pass it back to you. That's it from me, Corina, Farah, and also Khadija, <laughs> the Habitat <laughs> team. All right. Thank you so much for giving us this platform, uh, Penang Green Council. To share with everyone about what we have <laughs> all right thank you so much for the entertaining presentation now at least they know what's in the dark they know what's yes. what kind of animal that they're missing out so that is a very interesting and i myself would like to experience it one more time going up there and i'll visit in person all those animals <laughs> and but yeah later later i will contact you guys no worries but thank you for everyone who joined us so uh i hope you guys had fun and now I'm actually sharing the uh, our contact details. So if you want to contact us, you may contact us on, on this platform. You know, we also both of, both of Penang Green Council and the Habitat team actually has a Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and also web page. And for us, you may for Penang Green Council, you may also come to our office and email us any way you like. 
So you may take a screenshot of this page and then yeah, later you can say contact us if you have any questions or if you want to collaborate or uh, join us in our future programs. So before I actually conclude everything, I would actually like to take a photo, a group photo of everyone. Yeah. So hope everyone can open their camera so that we can actually, you know, have a photo of everyone, all the handsome and all the cute faces. So yeah, I'm opening up the photo. Wait, wait. Okay, so so I see that everyone is kind of shy. So no worries. You won't edit your photo. So, <laughs> so yeah, we will take a photo of everyone. Hope you guys can 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 open your camera for the photo session. I will proceed with the photo session in a few minutes. All right. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we are so ready we're so ready yeah. <laughs> all right yeah we're, we are giving a chance for everyone to do a final touch up okay <laughs> lipstick lipstick yeah. i don't know if you, are, if you guys have like your lipstick on the go or anything like hi hello, hello. Oh, good to hello. see everyone's face yeah. now <laughs> thank you for joining us throughout the session truly appreciate you guys now uh since yeah everyone is ready see there's some people are on their way to open their camera we'll give it a few more seconds hi hello hello don't forget your mask <laughs> hey i i think they are at home we are the one who have to put to wear mask right <laughs> take a spider here yeah. social distancing yeah. So yeah, we, we can learn a lesson from the uh, the animals somehow, like the spiders. Okay, seems like um we we have most of you on the camera already. I'm gonna have a green screen and you know, take a photo of everyone. So have a smile. One, two, three. Smile. And then one more smile. Yeah. Okay, you wanna change pose? Can can go go. All right. So. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, thank you for actually joining us today. And actually, the the for the winner of the quiz, I see that some of the people who joined and actually left. The winner of the quiz, I will actually contact you via your email and your WhatsApp, the contact information that you give. So thank you again for joining us. Hope you guys have fun today and yeah, for you to to come on on your weekend and join us. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for your your time and thank you, Habitat Team, for actually support us on this program. So feel free to join us on our future program. All right. Hope I can see you guys again in the future for any of our upcoming programs. So have a nice day, everyone. So right. have a nice weekend.